Peter. Um, and I, I have a, a nickname at campus called Dr. Hydrogen, and hopefully I'll be able to answer all of your hydrogen questions and um, we'll be able to answer everything. The, the only change to the title is I've added a why. Why on earth do we even need hydrogen in the first place? That's one of the questions that I'd like to answer. So let's begin. And I promised in the introduction, um, uh, some of the, the advertisements that went out on Twitter that I was going to tell a story. So this story is going to be based on The Hobbit. So hopefully you guys have heard of that before, um, but it's a it's a tale where you have Bilbo Baggins and he's got to go on a journey, he's got to go on an adventure and he's going to meet some, some um, mountain dwarves that dig down into the depths of the earth to find treasure and then there's going to be dragons that are going to hoard the treasure and we're going to kill the dragons and we're going to become better because of it. So this is the adventure, let's begin. Hopefully you've got popcorn, a cup of tea and you're sitting comfortably and I'll begin. So CO2 emissions in the UK. I've chosen the UK because obviously we're based here, but the emissions are very similar across the entire world. Um, what we've seen recently over the last 10 years is that the emissions from power generation have decreased massively, and that's the top line here. And that's basically because we've turned off coal power stations. Everything else hasn't really changed. We've made no progress really anywhere else in decarbonisation. So we've got a long way to go if we're going to hit net zero by 2050. And um, it's not going to be made any easier if Boris then backtracks on his targets and says, oh, well, we'll just change gas boilers or heating homes decarbonisation to 2040 now. So let's see what we can do. Hopefully I can persuade you that hydrogen can decarbonise all of these, or nearly all of these sectors. Whether that's a good idea or not, we'll find out. So, um, Bilbo Maggins has got to make a choice. He's got to say, we need to reach net zero. We've got to decarbonize everything we do in the UK by 2050. We've got about 30 years to do this. Are we going to choose the option that maybe costs a lot of money, but is really good? Or are we going to choose the cheaper option that isn't as good? Which one do you think he'll go for? So let's start at the beginning. What actually is hydrogen? Can tell me, somebody tell me what is hydrogen? It's an element. Okay, cool. What? It's a gas. It's a gas. It's H2. Excellent, cool. So it's, it's the lightest, it's, lightest of the elements. Perfect. That's what I was going for. It's the lightest of the elements. It's the smallest. It's the simplest. It's the, in theory, the easiest to make. It's um, it's the it's hydrogen. It's two molecules of hydrogen joined together. Now, if we compare the properties of hydrogen gas um, versus natural gas or methane as a, as a proxy for it, um, we can see there's a few differences, but it's also very, very similar. So they're both flammable gases. Um, so that's one point. And then um, if we're looking at the density, the density of hydrogen is almost 10 times less dense than methane, which means that if you're gonna, gonna send um, hydrogen to an end user, for them to use as a fuel, they need to move almost 10 times more fuel to that place. So it's potentially difficult. We can see that in the um, energy values where it's got a really good energy value per kilogram because in one particular molecule, it's great. But to compress that because of its density is very difficult and you end up with a very poor um, energy value per, per volume. And we're always going to talk about a volume. That's atmospheric pressure, by the way, that. This is atmospheric pressure, yes. Yeah. Yes. And it of course changes, but the, they change proportionally. So it's still going to be just as bad if you compress it. Um, it's also a very flammable, flammable gas and it's a, actually got a wider flammability range. So whereas if you have a gas, um, a room that is filled with natural gas and only got a very small amount of air in it, it won't go bang. With hydrogen, it probably would. Um, also, both of them are gases at pretty much every kind of temperature you can possibly imagine um, working with. And then um, the, the one sort of savior about hydrogen is that it's very diffusive, which means that if you opened a can of or bottle of hydrogen and you just let it go to the atmosphere, it would diffuse away very, very quickly. Whereas natural gas wouldn't, it would stick around, it would form a vapor cloud um, and it would become a bit more dangerous because of that. 
then you also have to, I suppose, look at the, the properties of the gas itself. Neither of the gases are odorless. Uh, neither of the gases smell. You can't detect them with your nose. You can't see them. And when they burn, um, it's not very easy to see either of the flames, actually. So they're quite similar in that respect. Um, but neither of those, or none of those problems are necessarily a showstopper. We can get around all of that kind of stuff. And in fact, hydrogen has been used for decades. Um, it's a very, very common gas in the industry. It's just something that now we're seeing it moving towards um, a domestic or a general person encountering it. That's where it's becoming a bit more dangerous. So I'd hopefully answer the question of, is it safe later on? So what is hydrogen used for? Can anyone answer this question? Mm. Hair products. Are you thinking hydrogen peroxide? Yes. So that will use some hydrogen to make the hydrogen peroxide. So yeah, you're right. That is partly it, but it's not the main part, main point. It's not one of the big users of hydrogen. Oh, you, you're missing your, your GCSE level chemistry. This, is, this will be covered in that. Okay, so hydrogen is used for these things mostly. So the big ones are ammonia production, which is then used to make fertilizer. So ammonia is nitrogen and hydrogen combined together. And then to make fertilizer, you essentially process that a bit further. And then the other main source of hydrogen is in oil refineries. They take big heavy molecules of oil and they add hydrogen and that makes smaller molecules that are more valuable to sell and more useful. There are also some smaller uses. So this is where you're making all the random chemicals. You can um, hydrogenate fats and oils so you can make um, butters and spreads. Um, and the, there's lots of other chemical uses of hydrogen. Um, and also you can make, you can use hydrogen in fuel cells to make electricity. And that could be used for vehicles. It could be used for heating. Um, there's lots of different uses you can use, but those bottom ones are very, very small percentages. The main ones are oil and ammonia. And, and this the will probably change. Process. Sorry? Is that the harbour process? Yes, harbour Bosch yeah. process. That's correct. Yeah. So um, this may change in the future, highly likely to change in the future. In fact, I think we'll probably see more fertiliser production because you're going to have more people to feed. Um, we may see less hydro packing in oil refineries because oil refineries may not be around anymore. But there's going to be other things that we could be using hydrogen for. So it's probably sensible to start thinking about how is it actually made. So who's heard of the different colours of hydrogen? Or have you heard of any colours of hydrogen? Mm -hmm. And do you know what they mean? Mm. Huh? Green hydrogen is manufactured by electrolysis. That's correct. Uh, Grey is not so good. I'm not quite sure which one that is. Uh, but but Please most hi but most hydrogen is is produced from uh, petrochemicals. I think in any case. Mm -hmm. So brown, I suppose. Okay. So you're right. Um, green hydrogen is produced from electrolysis. Um, it's produced. Mostly when we're defining green hydrogen, we're only talking about wind power, solar power, hydropower, that kind of stuff to make hydrogen. Gray hydrogen, someone picked up on, um, is natural gas. Um, it is essentially the, the main way of making hydrogen in the, in the world at the moment, um, and especially in the UK. We take natural gas, we take steam, heat them up, put them over a catalyst or some magic beans, as people like to call them, and then you get hydrogen out the other end. So going through all of these, brown is coal, so you can take coal and you can add steam, same sort of idea as the natural gas process, but you end up with way more CO2 emissions. Um, then you can use natural gas, you can also use oil, you can use um, any kind of uh, liquid or gaseous hydrocarbon to make hydrogen, that would be a, via a reforming process. But crucially, these first two release CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, 
they are completely unabated, there's no carbon capture, and they are almost the standard thing these days. There is very little electrolysis that happens in the world. A better option is to take either of those two processes. Ideally, we'll just ban coal, ignore it, get rid of it, and don't worry about it. Um, unfortunately, for countries like China, where they have lots of coal, but not very much natural gas, they're probably not going to be inclined to do this, which is why you need technologies um, that can allow them to still use hydrogen or to expand decarbonisation, but to, to decarbonise in the same way. So that's where blue hydrogen comes in. Blue hydrogen takes these first two processes, bolts on a carbon capture system to the back end, captures the CO2 and puts it somewhere else. And that's somebody else's problem then. That's a, another market to sell to. It can be put underground, it can be utilised to make a few small niche chemicals, um, but really there's no other option other apart from putting it underground in an old oil and gas reservoir, because the scale of production of CO2 is so enormous, it dwarfs any potential use case that you can make for it. So that's blue hydrogen. Um, then you've got green hydrogen, which as I said, is from renewables. And then purple hydrogen is where we start to get towards marketing of green hydrogen. Um, it's where you've used nuclear power to make hydrogen. So you use nuclear power to make electrolysis or to, to run an electrolyzer, um, or you can use nuclear heat to make hydrogen directly. But we're, it's very close to green hydrogen. Um, and the very final one that I wanted to sort of highlight was something called methane pyrolysis. Um, don't need to rem remember that name, but essentially this is a, a really fancy technology that would take natural gas and only natural gas and then heat it and produce the hydrogen, but it wouldn't make CO2. It would only make solid carbon. And that's much easier to store. You essentially store in coal and coal is very stable. You can stick it back in the coal reservoir as far as we're concerned. Um, but it's a nice way to make hydrogen, but it doesn't really exist yet. The first, uh, first four, so um, brown, gray, blue and green have all been fully commercialized and they are ready to go already. Um, there are lots and lots of other colors of hydrogen. You'll hear light blue, dark blue, yellow um, and indigo and purple, but really these are all just marketing of these main six. So whenever you see a random color of hydrogen, just think to these ones, because this is really what we're talking about. So um, the mountain trolls have dug out their, their fossil fuels, they've got their treasure, and now they've been overtaken by these dragons who are sitting on the treasure and liking getting rich on this. And this is where we're currently standing. We're producing 75 megatons of hydrogen every year for our existing uses, which is refining, oil, uh, refining ammonia and a few other little chemical processes. And the majority of that is coming from fossil fuels. Um, so the oil sector is used for the refining part, the natural gas part is used for the ammonia and coal is used where they haven't got natural gas available. Um, and as you can see, the, the trend for hydrogen production is only increasing. And if you look at pretty much any um, non-governmental or even governmental report, they are expecting five times production. Um, so they, they would expect this value of 75 to be multiplied by five within the next 30 years or so. So by 2050, that's, that's gonna be five times greater. And ideally, we would not want that to be fossil fuel based anymore. We would like to say it's potentially natural gas based with carbon capture systems, that's at least better, but hopefully would expand the electrical part or we do something to capture those CO2 emissions. So that's where we've got to get to. This is where we are at the moment. And how are we going to get there? So the wonderful, and I say wonderful in quotation marks because I'm not sure I fully believe that, um, the wonderful Boris Johnson has announced a 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution and hydrogen is one of those points. So he is planning on um, allowing the industry to somehow um, make five gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen by 2030. So that's less than nine years now to, to make five gigawatts of, um, of hydrogen. 
Now to put that five gigawatts into perspective, because I understand that five gigawatt makes no sense at all to anybody, even myself, it doesn't, it doesn't really, really make it um, real. This is what we currently produce. So in the whole of the UK, we use hydrogen to make lots and lots of ammonia, and we use lots of oil refining as well. Um, so we use about three gigawatt of hydrogen at the moment, and one gigawatt would provide enough energy for 42 homes, 42,000 homes, which is about half of Bedford's homes. Um, I checked the census data earlier to confirm that. Um, or it would provide 44 million cars, which is, I think, well in excess of, no, it's not excessive of the number of cars in the UK, but it's certainly, I think, half of the number of cars in the UK. Um, it's a lot. So, Obviously, we wouldn't be using it directly initially for homes or cars, but it kind of puts into perspective how much energy is actually there. Um, so it's a lot. And to make five gigawatt on top of the three gigawatt, um, or even replacing the three and then adding two more, is a huge ask within nine years. And at the moment, there's not much plan of how that's actually going to happen, and there's not much detail on it. Um, so hopefully that will change. We'll see. Um, hopefully I'll be able to persuade you that there are plans in place with industry that that is going to happen, but they do need some backing of government to make that happen. So, taking a, a broader picture, why on earth do we even need this hydrogen in the first place? Can't we decarbonize all of this other stuff with something else? Is it possible? You, are, you tell me. Certainly, Peter, I, I've been looking recently about um, heating at ca uh, Cranfield campus um, and heat pumps seems to be the favourite um, flavour of the month or flavour of the decade, if you like. Yep. Um, so that's that's only one option. Definitely is. Yeah, we, we definitely could electrify um, and use heat pumps for the heating homes. It would make a, a great deal of sense and it'd actually be cheaper to do it that way as well. Um, but we could also do hydrogen. <laughs> so the hydrogen could do homes. We could swap the natural gas grid for hydrogen grid, change the boiler out, hey presto, you decarbonise every single home in the UK. It would cost a lot of money, but maybe it's an easier option. I'm not necessarily saying it's a better option, but it's easy because people are already accepting of changing a boiler, um, whereas going to an air source heat pump or ground source heat pump or any of them, it would require a cultural change in the way in which people heat their homes. It would require everyone to make sure they actually get triple glazing windows, which I just had installed last week. Um, and it would make, it means everyone's got to actually make sure the house is insulated and make sure that they've cut those emissions massively themselves first before they even install the heat pump. So it's a, I think actually is a bigger challenge to go for electrification, even though I think it probably will happen at some point. And we can look at all of the others. We can say for every single well, every single other thing, we could do this another way. We could do this without hydrogen. Batteries, car yeah. batteries. Exactly. So for cars, you, there are battery electric vehicles. They are fantastic. You don't need hydrogen vehicles. Um, there's absolutely no reason to have a hydrogen vehicle, just a small domestic car. Batteries are great for that. When you start getting to bigger vehicles like HGVs, big lorries, big trucks, ships, planes, that's where batteries get difficult. You can't get the energy storage density that you need. And when you're traveling hundreds of thousands of miles and you're doing it on a very regular basis um, and with very fast turnarounds at each side, you can't, batteries just become completely impractical. And that's where hydrogen is probably useful. Um, and that's where we'll probably see most of the hydrogen being used in the future. And if you look at the CCC report, the Committee on Climate Change, um, that's where they're suggesting most of the hydrogen will be used. I would suggest, them, suggest something different, but I'll come on to that later. And then there's industry. Um, so industry is kind of like a, at least in Bedford, you don't see industry. We don't have industry in Bedford. You have to go up north to see the industry. Um, so we're kind of hidden away from it, I feel. And it, it wasn't until I actually went to university and actually saw the industry because I, I went a bit further north. Um, but there's no way you're going to decarbonize a cement plant with um, electrification. You just can't do it. You've got to use some kind of 
um, combustion fuel to actually give it enough heat. Um, and then if you're looking at steel plants as well, um, you can't really do that with electrification because it's just so much energy required and it's such a, a small thing. And I, I can't imagine that we're going to have a world without cement or without steel in the future. I think those things are always going to be there. And so we're going to need to decarbonize those big heavy industries with hydrogen because there is no better option. So that comes onto this slide. Um, this is uh, something that has recently come out um, from a, a Libric Associates. Um, I forgot who the guy was, but the guy's quite famous for doing something. Um, I'd have to go Google it to um, remember, but the link's down there to go and have a read. But basically they've drawn up this idea where some things for hydrogen are unavoidable. You've got to use hydrogen for them. So making ammonia, of course you need hydrogen to make ammonia. Um, and of course, if you're gonna do methanol production, you need ammonia for that, but you need hydrogen for that because it's based on the chemistry of it. But there are things at the other end of the scale where it's a better, it's more economical option um, for like cars, hydrogen vehicle, hydrogen fuel cell cars. Um, it's more economical to use batteries than it is to use hydrogen. So everything else kind of fits in between. And you can see that steel and shipping and aviation, they're more towards the top and you could do heating is more towards the bottom. It's not saying that, it's not saying that any of these are not doable with hydrogen. It's saying that it's maybe not economical. And that's the thing, they've only considered what is economical in this analysis. They haven't considered what is culturally acceptable, what is politically acceptable, what is doable within a time frame. Um, so some things might actually change on this scale when you account for different factors. But generally, it's a good idea to go based on this, or to think based on this. So some things are really, you have to use hydrogen, there's no other option. Other things, there's better options, but whether we go for those better options depends on political willpower. Okay, um, so this is a, a really interesting analysis. Um, this is out of date data, it's 11 years out of date now, but the general trend is still the same. We have um, heat data and electricity, electricity data shown here. So what we're showing is in red, the amount of heat demand or the amount of natural gas demand um, in the UK. And at winter times, we use a lot of heat and in summer times, we don't use much heat. In electricity terms, it doesn't really change seasonally. Um, day to day, sure, there's big changes and there's lots of things for natural, the national gas, national grid to manage and to control in terms of electricity, but heat demands for the UK are significant. Um, and sure, we can, insulate homes, we can install triple glazing, we can um, change the way people heat their homes to lower the temperature and things like that. And all of that will bring down the height of these peaks and that will definitely help. And we should do that. We can drop about a third of that just by doing the energy efficiency stuff. And we should do that. But we're still gonna end up with these peaks where we get some cold snaps coming in, we get the beast from the east. And that means people are gonna turn on heating and it's all gonna happen within a very short space of time that's where the storage of energy becomes difficult. And if we decarbonize heating via electrical routes, we've got to have a lot of heating or a lot of power stations turned off when we don't need them and turned on when we do need them and they've got to turn on very quickly. So an example here was a 120 gigawatt change over a one week period, which is equivalent to a huge number of power stations or wind turbines. And we just can't, turn on that number of power stations that quickly. And we can't leave those num that number of power stations or wind turbines stationary and idle for that amount of time. So in a way, storing heat in a chemical form like hydrogen would actually make a lot of sense. It would actually be a lot easier. So what choice is Bilbo gonna make? We've identified that we need some hydrogen. We maybe don't need as much hydrogen as um, decarbonizing everything with hydrogen, but we're going to need some. So what choice are we going to make? Are we going to go with coal, which is cheap, very mature, very scaled, but really poor CO2 emissions, the same for natural gas reforming, or we're going to go for something slightly better, slightly more agile, a bit of a younger person, 
better CO2 emissions, not fantastic. You're still going to have some CO2 that's going to be released. And if you're trying to reach net zero, you're still going to have to offset some of those emissions. But uh, the UK government actually recognises that a lot because they are pushing um, all of our hydrogen projects to be as high CO2 capture as possible so that they don't have to worry about offsetting as much. But again, it's fully scaled up. It's not too expensive. It's easily doable. And then you've got other options like the green hydrogen, which is much more expensive simply because of the cost of electricity. Um, but they're more like the hipster kid. They're, they're fully out there. They're an adult. They're fully grown, but they're the cool young person with a beard and they've got jeans that have got rips in them um, and they've got great CO2 emissions. And you've got the same for nuclear. This is a child. This is not fully commercialized. This is not fully demonstrated, but could be a bit cheaper. And again, good CO2 emissions. And then methane pyrolysis, or really we should encounter all of the other potential hydrogen production technologies and just say, this is the unicorn. This is the unicorn technology that is an absolute baby, hasn't been tested at scale yet, but could be great, but we don't know that yet. We can't really wait around for that. So um, finishing on this slide, I think we're gonna end up doing a mixture. I think we'll end up with half blue, half green, and it will simply be a matter of who gets there first, who builds it first. Um, I don't think there'll be any planning or thought behind it. It will just be a, a market-led activity. Um, and it'll be whoever can compete on cost in whichever scenario. There are some applications for things like glass where um, you need very high purity hydrogen. So green hydrogen, that's much better scenario for that. And because glass is expensive, you can handle the extra cost in it. Whereas if you're thinking about decarbonizing heating or um, industrial processes, you need cheaper hydrogen, but you don't necessarily need the high purity. So blue hydrogen might be better there. So Bilbo's made his choice. He's going to build some of these things, but where are they going to be built? So on the left, um, yeah, on the left, uh, we've got the, the green dot showing where hydrogen is currently produced in the UK. And on the right, it's showing where hydrogen might be produced in the UK in the future. So there's a huge number of things to be to consider um, when you're building a new plant. And should you build these based on where population centers are? Should you build these as centralized systems or decentralized systems? Should you consider costs as your main point or should you consider scale as the main point? Um, are you going to aim to produce hydrogen of a particular quality in a particular location, or are they all going to be for point users? So you'll produce hydrogen for one user and you won't sell to a grid. All of these things need to be fleshed out. And actually, I don't know the answer to this. I don't think anybody knows the answer to this. I think that there's a huge number of things to discuss and to, to argue out. And I think a lot of this will just happen by accident. Um, and I think it will start off by saying we'll have a, a single anchor project that could be Teesside or Humber, it could be Port Talbot or Aberdeen. Um, it probably will be all of those. And um, we will just build a few hydrogen production facilities there. And then there'll be a few other projects around the country that say, okay, well, now I want some hydrogen and I'll start doing it there. And it will kind of evolve over time. But I don't think there's going to be any major planning, although there probably should be. There's one dot that I want to pick up on, and it's just there, and it looks very close to Bedford, and that's because it's based at Cranfield, and that is the Hyper Project, and that's the one project that I'm working on, um, which I want to give you just a quick flavour of. I've only got I think, two slides on it. So Hyper Project is something that Cranfield University are leading, and I'm the, one of the main investigators in the project. It's in collaboration with Deuce and Babcock and a company from, the Ameri from America called GTI. Um, we've got a website that you can check out at the bottom there, and we've got a Twitter link as well. So what we're doing, I'm not going to go into any of this detail, but we're taking a natural gas reforming process. We're taking the same chemistry that's already used in the industry, and we're adding a CO2 capture material inside that reactor. And it's essentially limestone. We're digging limestone out of the ground, crushing it, as you would do for cement, and heating up. And by doing that, you're making calcium oxide, which can capture CO2. And we can then recycle that material back around multiple times to capture the CO2 continuously and end up with a very pure stream of hydrogen. And by doing this, you end up with a cheaper hydrogen. It's actually a much cheaper way of making hydrogen of a high purity 
than just bolting on a cap um, a carbon capture and storage system to the back end of any other reforming system. So this is in the process of being built at the moment. Um, it's been built on Cranfield campus. There's a, a shot, I think yesterday I took this before the rain started coming in. Um, it hasn't been fully built yet. We've still not got the main structures. We've got a few shipping containers there, but it will be operational hopefully by the end of the year and it'll be operational for a couple of years. Um, and we're hoping to be able to demonstrate the production of this cheaper hydrogen, low carbon hydrogen um, that can be produced at scale. So that's what we're working on at Cranfield. And that's why that blue dot is there on the map for hydrogen. Um, so reasons to be cheerful. Um, so I, I promised that there'd be some cheerful reasons. And this is one of the reasons. We have everything we need now. We do not need to wait for a unicorn technology in terms of hydrogen production or decarbonisation. We can decarbonise the entire of the UK tomorrow if we absolutely wanted to. We don't need to wait for new technology. Um, everything is fully commercialised already. And in terms of hydrogen production, all of our existing hydrogen plants are grey hydrogen and they're old. So that dragon is nearly dead. So they're going to be looking to decarbonize or they're going to be looking to either um, change the lifetime or, uh, of their plant or they're going to be reinvesting in new technology which could be the hyper process or hyper, hyper project technology um, or they'll be looking to turn off and probably off, offset the emissions or send the emissions somewhere else in the world which tends to be what happens um, that's certainly what happened with the steel isn't it so we have the potential to decarbonize all of the great hydrogen plants in the UK um, very quickly if we wanted to. Nine years is difficult to hit by 2030, but it's not unachievable. It is possible. And the reason to be critical, there is still that ring out there. The, the, the ring, the Lord of the Rings ring um, is still out there. It's still dangerous. There's still potential that we could end up with the wrong system if we're not careful. So. All of these changes require long-term investment. They require long-term political support. They can't be done on a, a five-year time scale for when parliament is sitting. We need longer-term support and we need government to not change policies after they set them. It was a good idea to say, we're gonna change all of the boilers by 2050 to be some other decarbonized form whether it's hydrogen or whether it's heat pumps, whether it's district heating or something else. That was a good policy to set in stone a date and say, this is when it's all gonna happen by. And now they pushed it back by five years, that weakens the entire structure of the, the planning. And it also depends on what people agree to. Um, will people agree to heat pumps? Will people agree to the way in which they change the, their heating? Will, it, will people agree to eating less meat, going on holiday less? or buying less from abroad. Um, I think some of that stuff they probably will do, especially if there's alternatives. But if they don't like the alternatives, then we need things like hydrogen that will allow people to still go on holiday or fly on holiday um, in a non-polluting way. So that's potentially what hydrogen will allow. It will allow hydrogen, allow people to continue living the life they want, um, but not impacting on the environment. And unfortunately, the, the people who are likely to benefit most from hydrogen are going to be the existing oil and gas companies, the energy companies. Um, you may say it's a bad thing, but these people are going to be the ones that have the money and they have the skills to actually make this stuff happen. Um, so it, it's likely to be them, whether people like it or not, they're going to make a lot of money out of hydrogen in the future. And the other point to be critical about or to think about is that anything we build now will be there in 30 or 40 years time. It's going to be there by 2050 and it's going to stay there longer than that probably. So we want to make sure that what we're building now is not going to be another grey hydrogen plant or another brown hydrogen plant. We want to make sure that these are blue, green, I don't care what colour they are, as long as they're there and as long as they're working sensibly. Um, and then what cost are we going to be willing to accept? Um, everything will cost more money because things cost more money when you do something different. And if we're going to capture the CO2 emissions, that's going to cost more money. Um, and hydrogen may be 
economically more expensive than other things like heat pumps, but it may be much easier to do. It may be politically easier for a government to say, right, tomorrow we're going to come around, an engineer's going to come around to your house, he's going to chop your boiler out, put a new one in, give you a new smart meter, and hey, presto, you're done. And then the natural gas grid will just change over to hydrogen over a period of time, and you've decarbonized a whole range of heating. You've decarbonized 25% of the UK's emissions almost overnight. Um, so it's a very easy option. And some of these are um, a choice between what is easy and what is cheap. And if the government's willing to accept a slightly higher cost, then great, let's go for it. I don't really care. It doesn't matter anymore. We've got to the point where we need everything soon, everything now. And to, to almost finish, um, I want to say how I think the story will be written. So we have all of these emissions. And if we go through all of them, I think we can say whether hydrogen will play a part in them or what I think um, hydrogen's role may be in them. So I think production, I said 50-50 split between blue and green, it will be dependent on what the user wants and, and I suppose what is demanded by the market. I think heating building buildings will be as many heat pumps as possible. It will be district heating where possible. So things like London will be a great place for district heating. Um, and I think that we will probably end up converting natural gas grid into hydrogen, especially in places like Teesside and um, Port Talbot, because you've already got hydrogen production there. They could make it a little bit bigger and then decarbonize all of the heating around that area by swapping the gas grid out. You can quite easily isolate the gas grid. So you could have a localized hydrogen grids. And we'll need some hydrogen storage, so we'll probably have more hydrogen salt caverns in the process. Um, electricity supply, I think, will be mostly um, not hydrogen, because it, that would be a very expensive way of making electricity. Um, cars, I think, just a, a general cars, like day-to-day -day cars, will be battery electric vehicles. Trains, buses, big vehicles, hydrogen fuel cells. Shipping will be either internal combustion engine of hydrogen, or again, hydrogen fuel cells. Aviation will be hydrogen combustion, um, mostly because those last three haven't got any other options really. Industry, electric where possible, but there will still be lots of heating for um, process heating. So where you need to heat up a gas or heat up steam, um, that's where hydrogen will be used, I think. And then uh, the waste sac sector. So this is landfills, this is anaerobic digestion um, and, incinerators in Bedford we've got one of those and that's going to have to have CCS on the future um, and then things like agriculture land use land use change and forestry this is essentially meat production are people going to be willing to give up meat are we going to have some other kind of meat in the future or artificial meat I, I don't know the answer to that one it's a completely out of my area of expertise um, I spoke to my wife about this earlier and I said would you be willing to not eat meat ever again and she said um, only if there's better alternatives and I said well have you not heard about the, the meat free burgers and stuff like that and I've said we've brought those before I've, we've eaten them um, and yeah she said she, she'd be willing to try it so <laughs> we'll see I'm not sure about that last one so in conclusion we can decarbonize everything and we can reach net zero we have all of the technology already we don't need to wait for anything but we need everything installed yesterday. We need it as fast as we possibly can, as soon as we possibly can, as big as we possibly can. I don't care what technology it is, we just need it now. Because otherwise, the, well, the, the cost and the impacts of the climate crisis is going to be stupid. It's going to be way more than the cost of changing hydrogen or decarbonizing things. So we can do it, great, but we need the social, the people and the political support to make that happen and those political issues will be more important I think than cost. So if you want to do some more further reading I recommend Carbon Brief, um, they've got a really good website, it's a massive website, it's way too long to read in one sitting but you can dip in and out of it so I highly recommend that but I'll leave you there, Bill Baggins has completed his journey, thank you. Thank you very much, that's uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, very wide ranging technical uh, issues that you've brought out there about hydrogen um, and also some very interesting policy uh, questions and uh, highlights um, which 
technical and policy issues is very much what this forum likes to discuss. Okay. <laughs> That's good. You've even mentioned food at the end, which has been um, something that uh, BCCF has been looking at a, a lot this year. So that's uh, there's a lot to chew on there. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'll just start off by picking out one or two questions off the chat, um, and then perhaps we can uh, uh, bring some people in to ask some questions. So, so uh, I'm not sure if this is an easy technical question, but um, there's a question about um, how much energy is involved in producing the three gigawatts of grey hydrogen? And, and that's, I was doing some reading up about hydrogen last night and I, I was, uh, I read something which said that um, I think it's certainly very carbon intensive, isn't it? Because the current hydrogen production worldwide, I think is something like 3% of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's, it's a uh, massive amount. Yeah, yeah, 3% sounds about right. Um, so actually I think it's higher than that. I think it's more like 7%. Um, uh, yeah, so for every, at the moment, for all of those uh, grey and brown hydrogen production facilities, um, for every one kilogram of hydrogen you make, you emit 10 or 11 kilograms of CO2. So massively CO2 intensive. Um, all of those hydrogen production processes, whether it's green, blue, grey, they are all about 70% efficient. So if it says three gigawatt, then divide it by 0 0.7 and you get the true value of energy. Okay, it was Lema Klemas, if I've pronounced your name correctly, and I think the other question that Lema asked was, how much CO2 do you produce per kilogram of H2? So you've, you've answered that one as well. Well done, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lema, is, was there anything else to your question as, as Peter answered it? Silence, so I hope, hope you have, Peter. Um, there's another question from James Quinn. Uh, James, you might need to clarify this. Um, <coughs> question in chat says, biofuel question mark, what about ethanol? Um, James, if you're there, could you could you just clarify what you're asking? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, well, it was basically when you had the uh, slide up um, with all the different forms of transport, and there was a question there saying, uh, what can decarbonize these? systems. Uh, not too long ago, I read um, uh, there's a, quite an interesting um, news story on the BBC website, which kind of took me back by surprise, uh, considering what country it was about. Uh, that was Brazil. And I was totally unaware that since the 1970s, the, the, the majority of their transport yep. system has been running on ethanol uh, yep. derived from sugarcane. And you, you know, you see what's going on in Brazil now, and I just couldn't believe it. It's like, they, you know, in their, their cars, their trucks, their buses are all running on ethanol, which is uh, compared to petrol, uh, virtually a non pollutant. Um, but it's basically just a question like, does ethanol have a role to play in this? Uh, you know, in, in the transport system, is it going to be like a. Because I don't, I don't believe that we can rely on one thing. I think it would be stupid to rely on one thing, like putting all our eggs in one basket on electric cars or on hydrogen fuel cars, trucks, etc. I, I think it's just a bigger risk. So it's, it's basically, I've been asking around and nobody seems prepared or willing to answer the question, you know, does biofuel still have a role to play or is it just being sidelined unfairly? So I have my answer, my short answer is no. <laughs> um, the long answer, um, if we go back to Brazil, the reason why they use ethanol for their um, for their cars is because they have that as a waste product. They make lots of, well, they have lots of sugar cane. That sugar cane is then crushed down, they get the sugar out, and then they're left with all this pulp. So they put that into a big reactor and make lots and lots of ethanol. And they have so much ethanol that they can't get rid of it. So they burn it in their cars. That's, yeah. that's the reason why. And then now the UK, the EU, I'm not, I'm not sure whether it's the UK or the EU have specified this, but we've now got the E10 petrol. So all petrol in the UK will have 10% uh, bioethanol in all of it. The problem comes when you try and do this at scale. In Brazil, they've got enough um, waste biomass that they can make all of this bioethanol. In the UK, we just don't have enough biomass. Um, and that's cost effective, basically. Yeah, I mean, that, that is the reason why um, Drax Power Station imports all of their, most of their biomass, 
I think it's 50% from the US because there just isn't enough in the UK or Europe um, to sustainably produce it. We can chop down loads of forest. I'm sure we could do it for a year, but then we're, in a, we're no forest and it's probably not a good idea. Um, and equally, there's no crops that we can grow at enough scale um, to make enough bioethanol. And it's the same with any time you see biomass suggested is going to be the, the way in which you decarbonize something. It will be used partly, but you can't do everything. Everybody wants biomass and it's going to become such a scarce resource. There's not enough of it to go around. Yeah. So that's my main concern. But I agree with you. We will probably end up with a mixture of um, hydrogen fuel cells and electric cars. But I'm not too concerned about if we ended up with only one or the other, because at the moment we've got mostly petrol and we can get by. We can manage a system at scale. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's a question here. I don't know if you mentioned um, rail at all, Peter, but uh, there's a question here about from Heather Mitchell about east-west rail. Will okay. hydrogen fuel cells be possible? Yeah, um, there's already trains that run on hydrogen. Um, Cranfield's actually got some projects with them. Um, Ballard Power. Um, if you're looking to invest money, Ballard Power. <laughs> um, they, they've also got some trains in the, in Germany that run on hydrogen already. Um, so yes, easily doable. Um, whether they'll do it for East West Rail is another point. They, they're saying they want to talk about net zero and all of this stuff, but I have no idea. I don't believe them. Um, at the moment, they're saying they're going to run freight trains, which are obviously not going to run on hydrogen, not initially at least. Um, my plan is to go and cut the rail lines when they start going back my, past my house. So <laughs> I'm going to set some thermite off and stop the trains. Did you have anything to add to that? Well, I just, you know, I just wonder why they weren't thinking about these fuel cells, really. Um, why are they talking about diesel? Yep. Is it old technology? They're just using old stock. They, they don't want to dump things, dump the old oh, trains. I don't um, know. Uh, I don't know. Mm. You're probably better off asking um, the mayor because he seems to influence more things than anybody else. <laughs> okay. I guess, Peter, the question is with East West Rail, is it is it cheaper in the long run to use hydrogen or, or is it cheaper to electrify the rail, railway line? Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's not a fair question. Cheaper, it would be cheaper to electrify it, um, at least initially, yeah. Definitely be cheaper. Definitely right. cheaper to electrify it. Okay, but of course that might change in the future if they, if they take a long time deciding to do it. Exactly, that's the problem. Like you, if somebody just said, like, we're gonna go electrification, or we're gonna go hydrogen, that would be fine. It doesn't matter what they choose, just choose one thing and do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Um, so, so another question kind of along those lines from, from Pip, Pip Sadler. Um, Pip, I don't know if you want to ask your, your question, um, but it's related to, uh, yeah, why, why, why should the UK go for hydrogen? Question uh, was, um, hello, in the last slide, um, you said um, the UK will need more than other countries. Yeah. And I was wondering if that's um, political or geographical or anything. And I was also wondering what other countries would be the ones to sort of watch in the sort of hydrogen development race to see where the technology is going. So the other ones to watch are Germany and Denmark, um, places, Northern Europe, uh, I would suggest the places to watch. Um, the US will probably have quite a lot as well. Um, the reason why the UK will probably use more than other countries is because we have a large population. Um, we have a population that won't really want, I, I'm very pessimistic of cultural change. <laughs> I think it's a much slower process than we can possibly hope for. Um, so I, I think we'll, we won't see the, the cultural change to allow us to do electrification of lots of things. Um, we have a, a quite a large energy base. So we, we, we need to have a large energy, uh, we have a large energy, de energy demand compared to other countries. Um, we don't have lots of natural resources like Norway where they've got lots of hydropower. Um, and there's a, a large seasonal uh, demand of energy. So heat demand is a massive thing. At the moment, it's 25% of our energy demand, just heating homes. Um, so yeah, I, I think those are the main reasons. Um, whereas you don't really see that in other countries. Uh, other countries like 
Norway, Sweden, um, although they're cold, they've got lots of natural resources they can call on. Um, so yeah, places that are cold probably need more hydrogen. I, th I think there's also something quite strange about this country in terms of its heating systems. We've got more boilers, as I understand it, than any other country in the world, except I think Korea. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, there's other countries like in the, in the US or China or whatever, they have different types of heating systems. They don't have uh, boilers like we have. Yeah, I mean, district heating is a much better way of doing things. And I was kind of hoping that when they put the incinerator in, in Stuartby, that they'd put some district heating in for that. But I don't think they're doing it anymore. No, there's certainly no evidence of that. Um, is there a point of clarification from Ian Smith? Um, so you talked about three gigawatts of capacity, um, and he's querying whether you meant three gigawatts or three gigawatt hours. But I think it's, it's, it's capacity, isn't it? Yeah, it's um, three gigawatt. It's 42 terawatt hour is what they're aiming for. So it's three gigawatts times how many hours they can run it in a year, basically. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, right, and a question from Keith Futter. Uh, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Uh, where does geothermal heating fit in? So again, this is comparing the options, I think. Uh, again, uh, what natural resources do we have for geothermal? Cornwall is quite good, um, but everywhere else in the UK is, is got too thick of a crust to make it really useful. Um, ground source heat pumps are kind of geothermal, but um, yeah, we don't really have the resources in the UK to do it. Does that uh, answer your question, Keith? Yes, just fine, thank you. Okay, great. Um, going on, uh, talking about, um, yeah, Martin Hamilton um, has asked a question, is it reasonable to consider a hybrid system of heat pumps and domestic boilers with the boiler, whether methane or hydrogen, covering the peak demand, but the majority are met with the heat pump? So a hybrid yes. system. Yes, definitely possible. It's the most expensive solution of all of them, and it could well be the one we go for. <laughs> Martin, do you want to come back on that? Uh, when you when you say the most expensive, um, why why would it be the most expensive? Because you've already got the boiler and the system in, so you're adding you're adding heat pumps on top of that. Yeah, it's because you're paying for a system that you're not using most of the year. But you're so, paying a, but you're paying a lot more to get the problem with heat heat pumps is that that um, unless you've got a really well insulated home, they work worst in cold temperatures. Yep. when your heat demand is the greatest. So you might end up installing nine times the capacity just to cover the one coldest day. Yes. You know, when when instead, so in other words, the whole project's unviable. Whereas if you just got on and put 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 a small amount of capacity, that would cover most of the year. Um, and your boiler then would only run one or two days a year. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, it's just that when you look at, for an individual home, um, over and you look at the costs over one year, it's probably not too bad. You can do it. Um, but when you scale that up to the whole of the UK and you consider that the UK is then going to have to have a huge hydrogen network to supply that heat for the peak of winter, plus then you need the electrical supply um, as base load, it's just, it becomes way too expensive. I, I think it probably will happen because it's, as you say, it's heat pumps on their own are not probably good enough. Um, for the UK because we do get the random events like the beast from the east and that's when you want the heating most. Um, so I, I think that we probably will end up with a system like that um, but it's not necessarily the best system. There, there's been quite a few things on Twitter recently. Um, I'll see if I can, in fact I, I think I've liked them. If you're going to find me on Twitter and look at my likes and you can probably find the, the analysis. Analyses. Right. I think um, Committee on Climate Change did something on it as well. It's one of the slides. Okay, thanks, 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 Peter. Um, more of a political question now. So, in, in uh, Lucy's asking, in terms of political and social support, are there projections for how many jobs can be created, uh, especially in comparison to fossil fuel industries? Yes, I don't know. So, the is answer. this a big job creation? <laughs> yes, uh, yes, it will be. Um, it's. I think it's the same as um, most industrial revolutions where everybody loses their job from one thing, but then they're making another job in somewhere else. So um, yes, and I've seen numbers batted around about how many jobs this might create. 
but I don't know the answers and uh, I'd recommend somebody goes and read somewhere else because I, I don't want to say a number. It, the carbon brief um, report probably has a better idea there. Okay, going, going slightly deeper on the political side of things, uh, David Oakley Hill, um, what a question, is there a danger uh, of con by fossil fuel uh, companies reinforcing their power? Because uh, I think you said it's this is the fossil fuel companies who are pushing hydrogen. Um, they'll be slower to cut fossil fuel extraction and use. Um, David, I don't know if you want to add to your question or perhaps Peter, if you want to comment first and then perhaps David can come back. No, I, I think you're completely right. Um, I think that we will, uh, well, fossil fuel companies will um, be the ones that end up doing the hydrogen production um, because to make, at least for making hydrogen in terms of um, blue hydrogen, but partly green as well, um, it's a it's a chemical process. It's it's a process that they are used to. These are big chemical reactors, and you need the skill sets to be able to do that. Um, it's not something that you can just start up a company and think, oh, I'm going to make some hydrogen, because it's quite a difficult chemical process to do. Um, so they've got the skill sets to do it. They've got the cash reserves to build these things. Um, they know how to inject CO2 underground because we've done that for decades as well. Um, so they can tie it all together quite easily and they can make a very attractive proposition to a government and say, hey, look, we can decarbonize your stuff. Does that answer the question? David, do you want to come back on that? Because I think you've got another question to follow on about the dangers. Uh, or asking if there are any dangers. Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I... Uh, I <laughs> I, I think it's a, a dangerous thing to, um, you know, for the fossil fuel companies to, to get just more power, even if they are the ones with it at the moment. Isn't there, uh, you know, aren't there ways we can somehow wrest power from, uh, from them? Because, uh, you know, we've, we've got local authorities and governments and everyone still supporting uh, fossil fuel uh industries and there are big campaigns to reduce that but um yeah. it's you know they are the ones doing a lot of the damage they are um and i, I completely sympathize with that um and i i i know <laughs> i know um but i i don't think there is another solution unfortunately um we we need because and uh, the other solution is um we don't fly we don't eat meat we don't um drive cars we don't heat our homes um we do everything else instead and I, I just don't think that's going to be possible if you think about the average person that's watching love island in a few minutes time or half an hour's time they're, they're not going to be the person that's going to worry about climate change they just want something easy and quick to, to allow them to live their lives um so unless you can change their mind i, I think you can't change fossil fuel sorry okay uh, i Charles Bailey, I think, has got a comment on this as well. Charles, do you want to come in? Um... Yeah, just to uh, read out my question, I think you'll understand that. I understand and share the resentment of big oil standing to scoop up the proceeds of H2 conversion. You know, I, I think we all loathe them like poison and hate to see them having a good time. But isn't this potentially a good thing because it will reduce their incentive to play a kind of tobacco industry, doubt sowing, delay, delay, delay strategy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it could build. You know, this thing that they, these are the people that um, have done the damage, but they can undo the damage very quickly. Um, we, as uh, as I said, uh, we've got the technology. Um, they've got the technology. They've done this stuff at scale before. They can quite easily do it again. Um, and if they've got the right incentive, like a good carbon price, which we're now starting to get, um, then that's a good enough incentive to actually make their investments happen. Does that answer the question? Mm, yeah. So it's a kind of qualified yes, but keep an eye on them. <laughs> yeah, essentially, I, I really love the carbon floor price, um, yeah. the EU ETS thing, just to only increase. It could never decrease. It could stabilise, but it could never decrease. If they could add something like that into it, um, that would be a better way of doing it because now we've got a carbon floor price with the UK. Um, there we've got, yeah, we've got carbon floor price in the UK plus the EU ETS, and it's like £61 a megawatt hour. That's huge. So for all of the, the steel companies and cement companies, they are desperately looking for something else to do because they can't afford this anymore. Um, 
So yeah, the same with oil refineries. They they don't want to be operating um, their oil refineries and emitting CO2 anymore. We've got meetings with BP all the time at the moment because they are desperate to do something. At the point where it comes less expensive, at the point where it comes less expensive for them to um, leave it in the ground, or, 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 or more profitable for them to leave it in the ground than yeah. to get it out, that's yeah. that's the break point. And if it's the same people making that decision, that may be a good thing. Yeah, sure, sure. And uh, I mean, companies like BP are quite happy to to do other stuff. They're quite happy to do green hydrogen. Um, hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Charles. Um, back to a technical question, uh, Jane Morris. For aviation, is hydrogen energy dense enough, or would synthetic avgas be needed? Avgas? Could you explain? Sorry, it's my husband. It's not me. Sorry, as you <laughs> hydrogen with the energy density for, for air travel, if we're still going to have air travel, can you get enough energy density from hydrogen, or is that going to be a technology where you need to take another step and turn your hopefully green hydrogen into synthetic fuels? Um, so yes, yes, it's dense enough. Um, people are still looking to make it denser by using ammonia or using um, even just storing water and then electrolyzing that. Um, so yes, it's dense enough. Um, in fact, I think, I don't know if I've got the slide in here. Um, I had some extra slides, yeah, here we go. If I share my screen now. Okay. so. Should be able to see a screen on hydrogen storage at the moment. Um, this shows the amount of energy that's stored in a, um, well, the amount of hydrogen stored in a meter cubed of um, a storage vessel. So for things like bottled hydrogen, um, this is compressed gas hydrogen, um, and we're currently storing about 25 kilograms of hydrogen in a meter cubed. And if you go towards liquid hydrogen or you go 700 bar or 350 bar hydrogen, you get closer towards 40. And a liquid hydrogen, which is probably what you have for aircraft, you can get about forty kilograms of hydrogen. Um, however, sorry, Peter, we can't we can't see the slide. We'll just, we oh. just see you. Oh, okay, that's not very good. Oh, there we go. Okay, now you should be able to see it. Oh. Yeah, see it now. Okay, cool. <laughs> sorry. So yeah, um, bottled gas hydrogen um, is stored at maybe 300 to 700 bar and it's about 25 kilos of hydrogen um, and then you can go further towards liquef liquefaction where you get about 40 kilos of hydrogen um, and that's that's better and that's probably what we'll be using on aircraft and there's projects at Cranfield I know and Southampton and Birmingham um, where they're they're doing that they're demonstrating you can run planes using liquid hydrogen or gaseous hydrogen and it's perfectly possible. However, you could look over here at ammonia and see 120 kilos of hydrogen per meter cubed. Ammonia is very easy to store. You can have a bottle of ammonia on your table and put it in a plastic bottle, it's, it's fine. And all you have to do is crack that over a catalyst and you've got hydrogen back. Um, so there are better alternatives um, that we could be looking at but for now, sure, hydrogen is good enough on its own. The, the biggest problem is the containers. So we can make any fancy container you want for a ground storage because it doesn't matter on weight. When you start going to an aircraft, that's where you can consider weight. So people are looking at things like carbon fiber and fancy materials. I was talking to a company today that's gonna like electroplate a coating inside a carbon fiber tank. Um, so that sounds really cool, but we'll see. Great. Um, Peter, I think you speculated at the beginning whether we'd get a question about safety and uh, Colin, yes. you've got that question. Um, so is, is, is hydrogen going to be safe in the home? I, I completely forgot to answer that question. So yes, um, uh, I was thinking today, how am I going to answer this question? Because I, I'm sure it's going to come up. It always comes up is, is hydrogen safe? Um, the way in which I think I can answer this is not only to say yes, but to try and back it up. So I am fortunately a very young person and I was not around in the 1950s and 60s, um, but some of you guys may well be. And back then um, I'm, I'm assured that you used to use town's gas for your heating. Town's gas was 50% hydrogen, quite a lot of carbon monoxide, 
carbon monoxide is the, the version of carbon that if you'd breathe it in, it will send you to sleep and you won't wake up again. Um, and there was also CO2 and methane in there. But that was pumped around your homes all the time. And you didn't, I don't think anybody complained about it being hydrogen or worried about it being unsafe. And hydrogen is something that's not new. It's been used for decades. It's used in mass scale for producing hydrogen, for producing ammonia and in raw refineries. The difference is that in industry, it is safe because it is well controlled. There is a lot of safety standards. There is a lot of regulation. Um, where we're going now is we're saying, we're now gonna put hydrogen close to domestic users. We're gonna allow a domestic person to interact with a flammable gas, which is probably no different to natural gas. We've become accustomed to seeing natural gas and not really worrying about whether it's flammable or not, or whether it's safe. And if you had, if you go driving or cycling around north of Bedford, you can see the, the big um, main hydrogen, uh, main, big main, um, natural gas pipelines that run through the country. There, there's signs saying, total, don't dig here. Um, so we, we're very accustomed to, to not worrying about other flammable gases. It's only that hydrogen seems more dangerous because we've got events like the hydrogen airships um, and hydrogen bomb, even though it's a different type of hydrogen. Um, yeah, it, you just, um, I think it is safe. It's just that we need to have the regulation and the standards in place. Um, we need to make sure that people are well trained and the engineers are retrained in how to use hydrogen, how to manage hydrogen. Um, I, I saw some some com some questions coming up here, or comments coming up about color and flame color and odor. I'm sure is a comment there as well. Um, again, I'm not worried. There, there's lots of other reports that come out recently from companies like Progressive Energy um, where they've looked at what odorants can you add, what colorants can you add, um, what happens if you just add 1% methane into a 99% hydrogen, then you see the flame. Um, these things are not insurmountable, they're very easy challenges to fix. Um, so yeah, I'm not worried about that stuff. Um, is hydrogen safe? Yes, it's safe, it's just people are not safe, but that's the same with natural gas. Um, okay, so yeah. Um Peter, there's another question here from Heather Mitchell, which is uh, similarly about domestic heating. Do we need different pipes for hydrogen compared with natural gas? And, and I, I'd like to ask a supplementary on that, which is, um, you know, I've read some articles which suggest that it's not very straightforward to actually convert mm -hmm. our existing gas network, pipe, pipe network, uh, to run on 100% hydrogen. I think as far as it's gone so far, people have converted it to 20% hydrogen, and because it's less dense, Mm -hmm. um, you get less energy, so it's not 20% energy even. Um, yep. so would you like to comment on that? Yeah, so um, putting those into numbers, if you um, put 20% hydrogen into natural gas, you decarbonize about 8% of the emissions. Um, so it's not equivalent to just knocking off 20% of the emissions and you'd still have to flow more gas down the pipe to make it happen. Um, in terms of whether the gas lines are safe or not, whether based on the current gas lines, the, the answer is we don't know. Um, we don't actually know, and this is very true, we don't know what the materials of the pipes are made of in those main natural gas pipelines. They were put in in the 1960s and 70s, and there's no data on that. It's not on the internet. It's not on reports. There's no reports that we can find that tell us what they're made of. We don't know um, what they're like. We, we can't go and dig the pipes up and see if they're still okay or not. So we have to, we have to do a huge amount of risk assessments for this. Um, so we know that if you, um, <laughs> I think it was a couple of years, it's probably a lot of years ago, actually, I was still at my parents' home. I remember when um, a road outside my parents' house was dug up and they replaced the natural gas pipelines with plastic pipelines. We know that those ones are good enough for hydrogen. So the plastic pipes that have been put in are good enough. We know the pipes that will go from those pipe, plastic pipes in the road to your house will be good enough. Things we don't know are the main medium and high pressure pipelines that hold most of the natural gas. We don't know if those ones are gonna be good enough for hydrogen or not. It's highly likely what we're gonna to have to do is put new pipes inside of those existing pipes um, just to make sure that they are suitable. Um, but yeah, we don't know, no idea. Very scary, that thing. 
I think there's also an issue about how you pump that gas, that hydrogen, because it is, as I say, less dense, so much less dense than methane. You need a lot more pumping power. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah you want to. One of the reasons why we're making hyper uh, pressurized is because it's cheaper to pressurize natural gas and steam than it is to pressurize hydrogen. Right. So yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so there's some so, still some research to do on that side of things. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, David um, Oakley Hill uh, asked a question earlier about um, yeah, battery cars. Obviously, there's an environmental burden with, with batteries from cars in terms of rare earth metals, uh, life, and, and um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the production methods, uh, disposal, etc. cetera. Um, so I think none of the solutions we've been talking about are completely clean, are they? But um, how do batteries stack up versus hydrogen in terms of environmental impacts? That's a good question. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, in batteries, you're going to be using things like lithium um, and a few other fancy bits of elements. Um, uh, in hydrogen, the main kind of elements or uh, chemicals that you're going to need to make hydrogen, at least in terms of well, in terms of blue hydrogen, you're going to want to use nickel. Um, nickel is a, a, an ore, a rock that you can dig out of the ground. Um, we've got plenty of that. It's toxic and it's a chemical like any other chemical. It's dangerous, um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. We can manage that. We have done for years. Um, the, also, nickel is not that rare. There's loads of nickel around. Um, the green hydrogen, at the moment, the electrolyzers and the fuel cells they use um, platinum or rare earth metals in their electrolyzer plates. They don't use very much of it, but that is obviously a, a rare earth element, so there isn't very much of it. Um, one analysis I get the students to do when we start the year um, is to calculate how much lithium you need to make enough batteries for every car in the UK to run on lithium. And you can just about do it. There is just about enough lithium in the world to make enough battery electric vehicles for the UK. Nobody else, just the UK. Um, and there is potentially enough lithium out there for everybody else if we go and mine it from the ocean, because there's lots of lithium in the ocean. But there's not much lithium actually out there ready in the reserves to go and harvest. Um, so, yeah, that's something to maybe consider. I don't know if that fully answers the question. I don't really know the answer. Um, I know that nickel isn't really a, a material to worry about, um, but platinum maybe is. But I'm sure that that can be changed. Okay, no, I'm not worried about that. And the, the reason, obviously, that you were going for saying batteries were probably a better bet for cars is uh, essentially for the usage. It's a more economical option for the, for the carbon savings that we're looking for. Um, yeah, and if... Like for me, um, pre-COVID, um, I used to travel to work every day. So that's maybe 13 miles there and, and then 30 miles back. That's not a very long journey. I could quite easily rock up at work and go back home and do that five days and then recharge at the end of the week. I, I didn't need a long or a big fuel tank. Um, I also didn't need a, a big car. And I think if we could move towards a system where we hire cars and it's like Uber, they, they turn up and it's automated and within five minutes, that'd be great. Um, I think that kind of stuff would make it much easier to see battery electric vehicles being shared because equally um, a car sits there most of the time not moving. But if we could have share cars and distribute the traveling times, then you don't need as many cars. You don't need as much as lithium to make all that, those cars. Um, hydrogen is great if you need a long fuel to, uh, a long uh, distance to travel. So if I go down to Exmouth to see, visit family, um, that's when, yeah, it's a great idea to have a hydrogen car. Otherwise it, it's just not necessary, it's too too much. Okay, um, there's another question here from Ian Smith. Uh, what is the estimated efficiency of hydrogen production from electricity? I thought I heard 70%, which is, yeah. I think what you said, Peter. But yeah, that is what uh, well, so Ian's querying that. He's saying, but that is much higher than I've seen quoted elsewhere. This this seems critical if hydrogen is to be used for road transport, given that Scania 
seem to have already moved to battery electric and dropped hydrogen. So Scania are obviously um, lorry uh, manufacturer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so is 70% op optimistic? Um, a little bit, it's about 67%, I think. Um, if, you, if you search for um, a project's report called Dolphin, um, D-O-L-P-H-Y-N, um, Dolphin Project, that was partly run by ITM Power and they had a, a phase one report uh, it's published by Bayes, so it's on the internet, it's public access. Um, go into that report, um, control F and then type efficiency. Um, they've got the efficiency, the current efficiencies of electrolyzers um, and what they predict it will be in the future. So it's about 67% at the moment and it's gonna to go to about 70% is what they're predicting. So it's, it's about those numbers. Um, um, whether that's good enough is okay um ian do, ian do you want to come in on this uh is there anything you want to add um not particularly no the um of course there are other inefficiencies like having to deliver hydrogen mm -hmm. um and i wondered how that compared with the efficiency of delivering electricity over the grid uh yeah, yeah so delivering electricity over the grid is much better it's about 90 percent efficient to do it with the grid um i would highly advise anybody that has any influence in planning not to make hydrogen from electricity and then convert it to electricity that's a really bad thing to do it's better just to keep it as electricity and store the electricity um, if you're making if you need hydrogen as a chemical as a chemical feedstock fine yeah you've got to do that you've got to make that efficiency loss um, but yeah if you can use electricity use electricity is there not some argument peter that uh, hydrogen could be used as for storage so where you've got maybe wind farms like in the north sea or whatever and they're producing excess electricity yep. then you yep. might be converting from electricity to hydrogen and then maybe back again later sure and that, that's like a that's a completely different story because that's like um dinorwig the, the yep. hydroelectric power station they allow electricity down and then pump it back up again and in reality that's the same thing we're just um we're we're moving it from one form to another form and then we're we're allowing the efficiency loss because it's really useful to do that so yeah we could do exactly that and that could mean that the hydrogen could um could be released as a short-term demand um demand response for electricity production and that's a, a different kind of story that's a different kind of economics for completely and, and i think the other point that in ian's question was about scania moving away from hydrogen to battery electric and that seems to be a trend in a lot of places. I think, is it Japan's going the other way that they, a lot of the uh, companies in Japan are, are sort of betting on hydrogen? Yeah, uh, Japan, um, when I first joined Cranfield, I had a slide saying Japan wants to be um, a hydrogen economy by the 2020 Olympics. Um, COVID kind of impacted that, but it, even they had a hydrogen flame for their Olympic torch this year. Um, so yeah, hydrogen is a massive thing in Japan because they are a country that don't want nuclear power anymore. They don't have natural gas reserves. Um, they don't have lots of wind turbines and things like that in place. Um, and they have high heat demand in winter. Um, so yes, um, hydrogen is a big thing in Japan. Um, as to whether Scandia is the, I mean, Scandia is huge, sure. Um, but there are companies like JCB that are saying, oh, we've got to use hydrogen because we're industrial vehicles, we're big and we're constantly running 24 seven. Um, I think we'll see, it's like, um, it's like Brexit. You, you saw like sugar companies like Tate and Lyle saying that Brexit's a great idea because they have their sugar company, they, they get their sugar from the Caribbean. Whereas British sugar were saying, oh, we don't want Brexit because um, we produce our, our sugar here and we don't need um, I think it's that way around, yeah. So that we don't need um, uh, to import anything. So it's it's fine. Um, uh, so yeah, it's I think it's companies having their own personal opinion based on what they do around the world um, and where they operate. So I wouldn't be surprised if Scandia are saying that because they are a Scandinavian company and they've got lots of free electricity and they don't need hydrogen. Um, so I don't know. Um, I think there's some politics in there. Horses for courses, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, Peter Norris uh, wants to go back to the um, uh, future use of hydrogen as a power source for the freight transport on East West Rail Line. All right. Um, yeah. Peter, do you want to? Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Good evening, Peter. 
Um, I've been fairly familiar with the uh, uh, ongoing uh, concerns over East West Wales projects for um, joining Bedford with Cambridge um, this year. Uh, I'm familiar with their approach to their method of uh, um, powering their, their trains. Um, they, their stated position is that their initial services, which run from Oxford to, to Bletchley, um, will be uh, that service will be carried out by a, a fleet of leased diesel electric passenger trains, which is fine with the idea that by 2030, when the uh, uh, Bedford to Cambridge section becomes live, that new uh, new technology will be available um, to uh, which would they, they, which would uh, exploit battery power, um, hydro uh, hyd hydrogen fuel cells. Um, so they can go into the future with uh, carbon free transport. The one thing that they've always played down is the freight capability of this new line. Mm -hmm. um, they have uh, at every turn refused to entertain electrification of the line from the start. Um, that's to, in order to keep the initial costs down. Um, yeah. The assumption being that something will come down that literally down the track that will enable freight train freights to be moved um, in an in a, uh, environment. Just bollocks. They're talking bollocks. Well, I, I, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but from your, um, uh, and they're building in gradients because of the route they're taking, which will um, limit the, the ability for, for freight trains to, to run at, at normal gross weights. Uh, the, the, uh, the way around that is you either use more shorter trains or, um, or you don't move the, or you double head the uh, the, the, the train with, with two yep. locomotives. Um, from your presentation, it would appear that all freight capable lines will need overhead electrification going into the future. I mean, again, it's a either or. You can do electrification, or you can do it hydrogen. There is no. There's no need to wait for some other technology to come down the line. It's ready. Well, that, that's the question, really. On your table, which which listed the um, had the ladder yeah. with um, uneconomical at the bottom, and I think um, I'm not sure what the top one was. Unavoidable. Yeah. You had long long, uh, long distance long distance train services were were up the ladder as being a, a, a sensible uh, uh, use of hydrogen. Okay. Uh, it wasn't a freight anywhere on on the table. Um, we are uh, in, in the in the absence of a suitable power supply. We will have to run on with the outdated diesel electric freight locomotives. Um, do you see that uh, there's any way around that in um, by using hydrogen power, or is this, uh, or, or do we have to force the issue over making the line uh, fully electric electrified from the start? So uh, because the line is going to be used for both freight and for passenger vehicles um, the, with the something I was quite disappointed about the, um, the East West Rail line is that they're planning on stopping everywhere um, and because they're stopping in lots of places that's a much better scenario for using um, electrification. So what I think you we probably will happen is we will need to electrify the line but the freight trains won't use the electrified line. They will use hydrogen. Um, those freight trains can already run on hydrogen. The technology already exists. I've seen Germany's got those trains already. Um, I am sure that they are just suggesting they're going to use diesel because it's cheaper. Um, once you start adding a carbon floor price and or carbon price into this, and they then start paying that carbon floor carbon price, that's when I think it will become better to use hydrogen. Um, I mean, it's quite a simple thing to do because you essentially just take the train off, put the new one on. So it should be quite an easy thing to do. Okay, thank you. That's, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for the question. Uh, Peter, um, I think we've run out of time for questions now. Um, I think you've covered probably 90% of them um, very well. Um, and it's a fantastic presentation that you gave earlier. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much again. Uh, thank um, you for having me. And um, I think I need to hand over to Lucy Bywater, who's got uh, some announcements to make.
Thanks, Gareth. And thanks, Peter. That was really fascinating. Um, you covered so much and we had some really good questions, as, as I think we, we expected. Um, I just want to mention really quickly before we go that um, the September the 18th to the 26th, Beds Climate Change Forum are taking part in um, the Great Big Green Week, which is under the umbrella of the Climate Coalition, which we're a member of. Um, we'd really love people to get involved by holding an event or an activity, however small or large. It could be via your workplace, your school or college, your trade union, faith groups, sports club, choir, really anything, anything you like. The objective is really to get people engaged with climate crisis, especially in, in our terms, but also in, term, in terms of wider environmental issues, especially in the run up to COP26 in Glasgow in November. It's quite shocking how many people do not know what COP26 is. They don't know how crucial it is. And we really want to sort of take this opportunity in September to try and help um, engage people who perhaps wouldn't normally be engaged with these, these issues. Um, so I know here I'm talking preaching to the converted as of this is often the case because people who've come along, you already engage with these issues, you're already incredibly knowledgeable about this. But if you can help um, help us spread the word about September, that would be really wonderful. Um, there's an email here I'm going to put in the chat that you can email if you'd like to know more or if you'd like to um, register an event because we're going to have a special dedicated website. And also in the chat, I'm putting our contact details um, that's Twitter and website and also the YouTube where you will find the recording of Peter's presentation in the next day or two and um, that's about it so really great thank you again Peter and thanks everyone else for coming um, I'm sure after, when you've got the recording some of you might like to to share it with friends and colleagues because I think it's been really useful um, and talking about the future now it's really gratifying to know that these technologies are here it's just the will as you've suggested that's that need it, is needed to make them happen so thank you everybody and we'll we won't be holding an event in august but we will be back in september as i say with the great green week so thank you everyone for coming thank you lucy and thanks thanks again peter Thank you very much. It was, it was really nice to have your questions. So, very good questions. You can come to my courses anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gareth and Lucy. It's a very good session. Yeah, well, there's some very nice comments there, including the comment which was, I need to watch the video to uh, go through it again. I think there was so much content in there, Peter. <laughs> well done. Do you want me to send the slides? I don't know if you want the slide to be uploaded anywhere. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be really great. We could put them on our website if you're happy to do that. Yeah, it's fine.